Welcome everyone. I'm Amy Lake, Director of Client Services with Rust Consulting. Rust, along with our sister firm, Kinsella Media, is pleased to be partnering with the Committee to Support Antitrust Laws to bring you tonight's webinar, Antitrust Perspectives, from Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser. Rust and Kinsella have been industry leaders for decades, with a long history of supporting antitrust matters, as well as close collaboration with Attorneys General. For example, we administered the Compact Disc and Microsoft Antitrust Settlements 20 years ago, and more recently, the National Mortgage Settlement Payment Processes, to name a few of, of dozens. We strive to make settlement administration efficient as possible, incorporating new technologies such as managing claims, deficiency processing, and payments all online whenever possible to help our clients achieve their objectives. To discuss any pending matters, you can always contact Rust's Senior Vice President and COSAL member, Ken Zylstra, or visit rustconsulting.com. From everyone at Rust Consulting and Kinsella Media, thank you for attending tonight's webinar. Now, please welcome COSAL Executive Director, Pam Gilbert. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much, Amy. Uh, it's just great to, uh, to be here and see everybody. Um, so uh, on behalf of the Committee to Support the Antitrust Laws, I'd like to welcome you all to our first virtual event featuring a state attorney general, Colorado AG Phil Weiser. Uh, as Amy said, I'm Pamela Gilbert. I'm the executive director and legislative counsel for COSAL. This year, COSAL celebrates our 35th anniversary of fighting to protect and strengthen legal rights to hold antitrust violators accountable. I want to thank our sponsor, Russ Consulting Kinsella Media, and their fabulous team, Amy Lake, Ken Zylstra, Luther Hermanson, and Jen Olofsson, for pulling this event together. Russ Kinsella uh, joined COSAL the moment we opened our membership to sponsors and has been one of our strongest and most reliable supporters ever since. We are so appreciative of everything you have done for COSAL over the years, including sponsoring tonight's event. Before we begin the main attraction, I have a couple of housekeeping notes for everybody. We will have an opportunity to ask Attorney General Weiser questions after he speaks. And there are two ways to ask the questions. At any time during the, the evening, you can type a question into the Q&A function that at least on my computer is at the bottom of my Zoom screen. Please don't use the chat, please use the Q&A. The other way you can ask a question is by using the raise your hands function while, while the Q&A is going on. And so then you also go to the bottom of your screen and hit raise your hand and you'll be called upon and then you can ask, uh, you can ask the question yourself. So two ways, you can type it into the Q&A or you can raise your hand during the Q&A uh, and, um, and ask the question yourself. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Joshua Davis, who is a professor and director of the Center for Law and Ethics at the University of San Francisco Law School, a COSAL member, also counsel to the Joseph Saveri Law Firm, and law school classmate of the Attorney General, and he is going to introduce our speaker. So take it away, Josh. Thanks very much, Pam, and uh, thanks very much to, to everyone at Russ Kinsella as well. It's a great honor to get to introduce Attorney General Phil Weiser today. As Pam mentioned, we were at NYU Law School together uh, quite a few years ago. It, it doesn't matter how many, let's just say more than five. Now, in my introduction, my plan was to praise Attorney General Phil Weiser, and there is a lot I could say. He obviously is the Attorney General of Colorado. At the University of Colorado, he served as Dean and he is the Hatfield Professor of Law and Telecommunications. He's also the Executive Director and Founder of the Silicon Flatiron Center for Law, Technology, and Entrepreneurship. He's a highly influential scholar, particularly in telecommunications. He's written two excellent books in the area, numerous articles, and he's an expert in regulation, including antitrust. Uh, he served as a law clerk, not only at the Tenth Circuit, where he was actually a co-clerk, I believe, with my colleague at USF School of Law, Professor Michelle Travis. But he also served as a clerk on the US Supreme Court for the notorious RBG and also for uh, Justice White. 
And he served in both the Clinton and Obama administrations. In the Obama administration in particular, in 2009, he served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division. And in 2010, he served as Senior Advisor for Technology and Innovation to the National Economic uh, Council Director. Overwhelming, right? It's absolutely overwhelming. And uh, I was gonna list all of that and believe it or not, quite a few more things potentially. And that's when it hit me that the last thing in the world that Attorney General Phil Weiser needs is more praise. I mean, think about his uh, poor wife and children. He must be insufferably smug at this point. So I'm not going to mention any of the accomplishments I just mentioned. I want to address instead uh, what Attorney General Weiser has not accomplished. And that's a much shorter list. I came up with just two items. First, uh, I believe he has never won an Olympic medal in figure skating. And uh, second, as far as I know, he has never hit a hole in one on a golf course although there are rumors he may have done so at mini golf uh, some point in the 90s. Uh, I haven't been able to confirm or deny that, so that's where we are. Okay, but in all seriousness, as I said, uh, I know Phil from NYU many years ago when we were on the Law Review. He was a great guy then, and he's a great guy now. Uh, he's an excellent lawyer, he's a thoughtful scholar, and he's a committed public servant like the folks on this call. He wants to do the right things about market competition for the right reasons. That has made him a great friend to private antitrust enforcement on behalf of myself, not on behalf of COSAL, which I know I can't do, but on behalf of, my, of myself, I wanna say that I hope we all support him in his reelection campaign. We'll be doing ourselves and the country a service. And, and without further ado, that was probably too much ado already. I'm delighted and honored to introduce uh, Attorney General Phil Weiser. Thanks so much. And uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, and please say hi to Michelle for me. Uh, I she sure. is um, dear and really a special person. This is great to be with a group of folks who are deep in the antitrust weeds and believe in competition and enforcement to help consumers. So I wanna keep my remarks relatively brief, but I do wanna set some background. And the background is the nature of our economy today has a lot in common with that of hundred years ago a level of concentration and diminished competition, barriers to entry and consumers, and in many cases, workers, finding themselves really under the thumb of large enterprises that are not being subject to the discipline of market competition. And that is a threat on multiple fronts, including to our economic growth. When competition is robust, it creates new opportunities for entry, it creates room for innovation, and everyone's better off. Businesses, in many cases, are not exactly itching to have competition. They're going to look at how they best position themselves. And it's really up to the antitrust laws to police the boundaries of private conduct. It is a system that is a truly American system around a generation or so, a century and change, 130 years ago, that we began to engineer. To start with just one example of how things have gone wrong, consider the airline industry. The airline industry came out from a period of regulation that suppressed competition, suppressed innovation. We saw a lot of entry and a lot of competition for a 20 year period, circa 1980 to 2000. From circa 2000 to today, what we are seeing is a diminution in competition. What we are seeing is a ability of firms to reap profits and in many cases, not to serve consumers well. I'll give you a couple examples on that. First, when gas prices went up circa 2016, uh, fuel prices, I should say, airlines um, would raise the price to consumer. And then prices went down during that same year, remarkably, but they didn't lower the prices to consumers. Instead, they made record profits and gave consumers peanuts. So if heightened cost gets passed on, but lower costs don't get passed on, that suggests a lack of competition. 
we need to recognize that. And then we need to ask what happened. And in the case of the airlines, there are a couple of causes. One, the courts failed to enforce effective predatory pricing protections. And what we saw was upstart airlines like Vanguard Airlines pushed out of business by American who could swamp the market with more flights and meet or undercut the discount prices, wipe Vanguard out of business, and then go back to the way they were doing business before, setting a pretty powerful reputation for predation. As Scott Hempel and I discussed in an article, that was allowed to happen by the 10th Circuit, and that really was a wrong turn. The wrong turn was motivated by what all of us know as Chicago school thinking, which is to say, oh, don't worry about antitrust enforcement. We don't need it. Instead, we want to see the market work because the market will correct, every, correct everything. And that's something that is a, I think, at this point, proven wrong turn, or as Bob Potofsky put it, overshooting the mark. Because in airlines, the market didn't create everything. Consumers now have less choices, they pay more, and there's less room for innovation. And as we think about competition more broadly, we need to think about effective antitrust enforcement, which means section two, the predatory pricing case I mentioned. It means mergers. We allowed too many airline mergers to happen, which facilitated the market structure we have. It means looking at other actors like the Department of Transportation overseeing code sharing alliances or access to slots. All of that contributes to competition or not. And the Biden administration put out a important document in executive order calling for urgency, calling for action around how to facilitate competition, suggesting a potential zetgeist of this moment. We will see in Congress whether that zetgeist is shared in the legislative as well as the executive branch. The legislative branch has an opportunity to deliver what you might think of as a brushback pitch to the judiciary. We've seen this in other contexts, voting rights comes to mind, where earlier voting rights decisions failed to give effect to the Voting Rights Act, and we saw legislative action. We saw a reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act on a bipartisan basis, 2006, Congress is once again set potentially to pass the Voting Rights Act. That's true in the antitrust laws too. When a law is not interpreted properly by the judiciary, think about you know, uh, predatory pricing uh, as an example. And there's obviously other examples as well. I could talk about how Trinco has been interpreted as well. We need to see a brushback pitch. And there's a number of legislative provisions that would provide appropriate guidance to the courts that with both executive and legislative leadership is important. So that's part of the ZET guys. What can we as state enforcers do? Well, let me put a quick pitch. We want to make sure that we are honored and treated the same as federal enforcers, which is what I believe the Hart Scott Rodino Act calls for. What does that mean? It means that the decision in the Facebook case obviously is an affront to state sovereignty and state antitrust enforcement, applying the latches doctrine to a state actor. Um, we've got work to do to address those sorts of decisions. It also means we've got to actually do the work of developing the facts and, and economic theories against the law to move the law in a better direction. In bringing the Google case, that is very much on our minds of how we address both the concentration of market power in a firm that is able to exercise it in a way that hurts consumers, and also to make sure that we establish clear precedents. The Microsoft case was a critically important precedent. I was able to work with Joel Klein when he was pursuing that. We see this Google case as a generation later, another important precedent to promote competition in a critical marketplace. We also need supporters, a broader discussion, making clear that there is a path forward, but it's gonna take work to pass this legislation, to bring the right sort of cases, and to educate and engage the public around what it means to have effective competition policy. I will put in the chat shortly a article or a, a testimony I just gave, which is something that uh, very, very few people read, but now you all can take a look and, and share it. 
Um, it was talking to the subcommittee on antitrust. And I will tell you, it is a pretty important fact that we have this subcommittee antitrust holding the hearings they did, issuing a report and building support on a bipartisan basis. And let me uh, brag a little bit about Colorado because we have both Joe Neguse and Ken Buck, a Democrat and a Republican, working together on bipartisan antitrust reform, including a law that would allow states to not get uh, their lawsuits put into an MDL, uh, something that um, we as state enforcers would prefer to be able to avoid, just like the federal enforcers can. So we're at a very interesting antitrust moment from the public discussion, from the legislative discussion, from the executive branch leadership, and maybe to push back on the judicial hostility that I don't believe is warranted. When you think about the Chicago School, it is a, um, I believe, a fair critique of some of the 1960s decisions. Think about Vaughn's Grocery, but it's not a governing doctrine that is serving competition or consumers well, and that's gonna be a challenge we're gonna face. Think about the American Express case at the Supreme Court. Again, too quick to be willing to assume that the market would sort things out and putting antitrust enforcers to uh, very difficult burdens to meet. So let me stop there. I've shared a fair bit. I see the first question from Josh, which I am happy to answer live. Um, it says, I said state antitrust enforcers should have the same respect as federal antitrust enforcers. That makes a lot of sense. Nonetheless, do you see the role of state government antitrust enforcers as different in any way from the federal government antitrust enforcers? Uh, that is an important point. Um, let me offer a few uh, ways to think about it. First, as a matter of the interpretive power, I do believe we are similarly situated and it's not the case that if the federal government thinks one thing on an antitrust matter and the state force thinks another, that the court should defer to the federal government. Um, this came up in the Sprint T-Mobile merger litigation where the federal government weighed in and said, oh, don't worry about those states. Uh, they should not get a fair hearing because once the feds are on the other side from them, their authority is at a nadir. And the federal court rejected that argument as a matter of interpretive authority. As a matter of practical expertise, as well as capabilities, states tend to have uh, smaller teams. And so if there are bigger cases, states have to work together in so-called multi-states, which is what we're doing in Google, um, which can be done and we're doing it, but it really is done less frequently. And so more often the states will play a complementary or a backstop role to the feds. And we're at our best when we're in collaboration with one another. And I found that dialogue to be very useful. We did have one case in Colorado involving hospital, I'm sorry, uh, healthcare, where it was a Medicare Advantage plan where the insurance company was buying up these practices and the practices were a real issue that we thought it was gonna cut off uh, leads for a rival to the dominant firm who was buying up a practice. And that dominant firm had seen its share shrink from 75% to 50% of the market. And we saw this as a response to that because they had this upstart. It was dominant firm was Aetna, um, I'm sorry, United Healthcare. The um, upstart was Humana. And we were able to ensure competition could continue by getting some uh, competitive requirements as part of the merger. And the FTC didn't act in that case. So we were able to both complement their action where they didn't act as well as be a backstop. All right, uh, Pam has given people two ways to get questions. I'm happy to take them. Hi, this is Paul Novak. Um, and I, I guess I can start off. Uh, let me just ask, how would you assess the state of cooperative federalism between the states and the, the Department of Justice currently as it relates to antitrust enforcement? Um, and, and how would you compare it to that during the last administration? All right, I could have given this whole discussion on uh, cooperative federalism. Um, what I will do is I will share my uh, 
propose my remarks that I gave at Loyola on this very topic and um, keep my remarks a little more brief that way. People may or may not have known they're gonna leave with some reading material, but <laughs> now you're on notice. The, the past administration, I think was an idea on cooperative federalism. Um, that brief filed in that T-Mobile Sprint case, essentially discounting the respect of state enforcers was um, deeply problematic. And I think it was interesting to note that there wasn't a single state that joined the DOJ in its AT&T Time Warner um, merger case. And the challenge is the DOJ, for whatever reasons, didn't seem to take states as seriously. And states have sovereign authority on their own. And, and it's important to lead with respect. Um, I learned that respect at the federal government working with state agencies. Now I'm on the other side, I expect to be accorded respect. Now in the case I mentioned before, the FTC, they didn't choose to act, but they still cooperated with us and they still engaged with respect for cooperative federalism. But in that Sprint T-Mobile, that was quite a strong position taken. And so I, I would say that was an idea. Um, it's early in this administration. So the honest answer is we don't know, but I will say I'm encouraged and we look forward to having continuing dialogue. I see Pam has her hand raised. Um, if she can be elevated to, to ask a question. It's very complicated. <laughs> I have. Thank you. Um, so you had mentioned the um, the House Judiciary Committee's uh, uh, antitrust subcommittee's really good work, their series of hearings and investigation and the report, and then the um, the bipartisan legislation that that uh, came out of the committee recently. COSAL um, supports that package of antitrust legislation. We're um, helping to work to try to get it to get it further through the process. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, more about maybe some of the uh, substance of those bills and you know what you think of them. Yes, yeah, so there are, I think, five bills. I mentioned one of them, which is the venue bill. Um, there's another bill that I understand is going to get continually developed because it, it begs some questions. It's a form of non-discrimination, interoperability, access on major internet platforms. And this bill is I would say a cousin of another concept we've heard talked about, do we need some terms of internet platform agency overseeing access? Um, as those who've been students of the at and consent decree know, that was a really interesting moment because you had both antitrust oversight that went side by side with regulatory oversight. Um, and so I find that bill very intriguing. What is gonna be important to figure out is Will that give the FTC these regulatory powers as well as its antitrust powers for these sorts of non-discrimination, um, call it interoperability, data portability? And that's a, that's a very important conversation. So I view that bill as um, driving that conversation. Uh, another concept that's there is a concern about the standards when a dominant firm uh, purchases firms that are emergent or nascent threats. Um, and that's an area that I also think we need to learn from what's happened because some of the dominant firms have indeed looked to do that sort of merger and acquisition policy in ways that with the benefit of hindsight, we see as anti-competitive. We believe under current law, we have the ability to make such a case. That's what the Facebook case is premised on, it's sort of either I'll buy you or I'll bury you strategy. And it is worth having the law clarify that given that we know the courts have tended to take a less than hospitable stand to antitrust enforcement on account of um, certain Chicago school thinking. What I would say collectively is the overall flavor. It's important to see legislation in this area because that sends a message to the courts. Right now, the courts are too often, think about American Express, think about Qualcomm, asking, 
how can I justify a finding of no antitrust liability? If you look hard enough to talk yourself out of finding liability, you may find a way to do so. In those two cases, they did. As opposed to, and just think about the case I mentioned, the American Airlines Vanguard case. Does something here not quite add up? Is the purpose and effect of what happened truly about competing on the merits? Or is it about undermining would-be rivals so I can keep a dominant position? And I do believe when that is a concern and there's a good economic learning to support it, the courts need to take it seriously. And unfortunately, that's not always happening. Hi, this is Dan Drockler. I see that uh, Deborah Elman has her hand raised, if uh, she can be brought in. Hi, sorry, I didn't expect to be kicked out and brought back in. Anyway, um, good evening and thank you so much um, for joining us, General Weiser. Um, I have a question about surcharging. Um, it looks like, and for everyone, I'm talking about um, surcharging for credit cards um, and allowing the merchants um, to surcharge when they take the credit cards, which right now there's a huge debate about whether or not the rules, um, well, well the, the rules of the various companies are sort of linked to each other. But anyway, I wanted to, to ask you about um, Colorado's experience with that and if there's any interstate um, discussions about that. Let me start by framing this a little bit. This, this was a um, issue in the American Express case I mentioned where American Express wanted to tell all sorts of merchants, you can't do anything to steer people away from us by giving them a discount or else you can't accept, you can't use American Express cards. And that was initially said to be anti-competitive the economic testimony by Michael Katz was compelling. You had a Second Circuit ruling um, that I believe, I'm trying to remember, I think the Second Circuit upheld that, or Second Circuit, I'm forgetting if they overruled the Second Circuit, but then it got to the Supreme Court after the um, petition by not the Justice Party member service, but by the state of Ohio. And then the court went ahead to bend over backwards to justify what American Express was doing. So as a matter of antitrust law, um, American Express continues to have discretion. I believe the question then gets to, are you seeing state legislation on this and what's been the experience of state legislation and has it been talked about? And I will say that's one of the options to think about where you have rules that are pro-consumer or pro-competition, should you see it in the form of state or federal legislation as opposed to the antitrust laws um, adopting it. And I don't know is the um, answer here. I need to look more into how this has played out. The evidence, as I mentioned in the American Express case was compelling that what Amex was doing was hurting consumers. Um, and as people here probably know what the court did is they pulled out this card of a two-sided market and they said, oh, but the DOJ hadn't shown that the harm on one side of the market consumers actually outweighed any benefits on the other side, the points people were getting versus paying more at a merchant. Um, so I don't know, we gotta look more at that. Um, I'll put that on my to-do list. Yeah, and Colorado did pass a recent law, but um, I don't know that there, we have enough data about that law to, to have a level of confidence, whether it's positive, negative, what have you, just went into effect. So we'll, we'll be watching this and I expect uh, other people from other states may say how it's working, which gets to the point of the question that I should uh, make sure I'm watching it. So I'm positioned to explain that. Thank you. Okay. Um... The antitrust bar at our best has a great tradition of collaboration, respectful discourse. Those who represent government enforcers, plaintiffs, lawyers, defense counsel, working within a structure that invites dialogue. And that structure should have people marshalling 
empirical facts, developing theories based on economics, and debating it in the courts. That I worry about more broadly because we're living in a moment right now, um, and it is a uh, it's a really delicate uh, and difficult matter. So I would encourage all of us to keep that mindset. And I will tell you one thing I am doing, I'm gonna put a couple of things in here um, in his role as being the head of the American, or so the Attorney General Alliance is developing a better um, civic education program around uh, how we talk to one another with that level of respect and engagement. And we're calling it the uh, Ginsburg and Scalia initiative. What do you think of the uh, role that uh, the uh, or the existence of the both the Republican and the Democratic Association of Attorneys General has uh, played? I uh, I have uh, some experience in being in uh, an attorney general's office. I was uh, in New York's office, uh, but it was prior to both Daga and Raga, and there was only. Nag, um, do you think, uh, as part of this uh, discourse that you're talking about, that you could reduce uh, some of the uh, uh, developments that have occurred in recent years, or do you think that those institutions are beneficial? I really appreciate that, and, and I want to start with antitrust, and I just want to shout out and, and share some love for Doug Peterson from Nebraska, who's been my partner in the Google case and has shown a robust commitment to antitrust. The bipartisan commitment to antitrust is so important that competition as a American value and antitrust as a rule of law value is not, is not undermined in the politically polarized environment we live in. And the state AG community, if you look at the generic drugs case we're bringing, the Google case, the Facebook case, we're not seeing that polarization dynamic. Congress is testing this proposition, and Ken Buck is showing a bipartisan commitment to caring about antitrust. But I think Ken Buck is facing a more uphill battle given the environment he's in versus the environment that I'm in. Dan points something out, however. My environment is absolutely affected by the existence of a Republican Attorney General Association and a Democratic Attorney General Association. That creates room for more mischief, more polarization. It is on me to maintain that commitment to the rule of law, to collaborative problem solving, and to not allow issues to be undermined and put into political terms, given what we have to do is fundamentally legal in our work. And what I want to do is share a podcast I did with Lawrence Wasden with um, the National Association of AGs talking about the commitment to the rule of law and to keeping the uh, spirit that I believe um, Dan, you so nicely touched on. Um, it is harder to do that today than it was 20 years ago, pre Raga Dada. And I will tell you, one of the low points for me was when so many of my Republican colleagues joined with the Texas AG in a case to overturn the Supreme Court election, overturn the presidential election at the Supreme Court. At that time, however, Lawrence Wasden issued a statement talking about doing what was legally right and not politically expedient. He refused to join that. So I choose to focus more on the um, inspiring voices out there. And then when January 6th happened, we got 47 state AGs out of 51 to sign a letter condemning that event calling for accountability. So we're still holding on to that, Dan, even in the face of those forces. Okay, well, good luck with that. Uh, I think it's important for all of us. Um, I think Pe Peggy Wedgworth has a question, if we can bring her in. If you can hear me, uh, uh, Attorney General, I'll go ahead with my question. I, I wanna inquire about the Apple epic opinion that Judge Gonzalez Rogers came out with last Friday. And I don't want to limit your comments on the opinion, but I wanted to ask specifically what was 
what are your thoughts going forward as she held that it was the unfair prong of the California law under the UCL for which she would issue a nationwide relief with regard to Google uh, and their 30% tax and whether or not Epic could, uh, could direct consumers to other websites to pay, et cetera. And any thoughts on that? Thank you. Peggy, if you'd be so kind as to put the link to the opinion in the chat, or someone can do that. I have yet to read that opinion, Peggy. Okay. And I, I, I need to do that. Um, we are, as states, litigating against Google relating to uh, in-app fees um, from the App Store, which is obviously very uh, closely related to the issue you mentioned. So reading this opinion is on my to-do list, but I haven't yet, and so I'm not in a position to comment about it, but I... I look forward to uh, reviewing the opinion and related to what you said, in our case, there are both antitrust and unfair and deceptive trade practice claims that we've made. And we'll see um, uh, where that opinion goes. I, I assume it's gonna be appealed. Um, I've even heard by both parties. So we're gonna um, get some more guidance on. It's gonna be an important decision. Thank you. General Weiser, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering more broadly, and particularly given how the Supreme Court has clipped the FTC's wings on disgorgement, um, whether you see an opportunity for state attorneys general to more assertively uh, uh, bring disgorgement type remedies uh, and restitutionary remedies is part of the role of state AGs kind of banding together to, to approximate the type of, of remedy the FTC used to be able to obtain on a national basis. Yes, I do believe this leaves a vacuum that states need to help fill. And hopefully the muscle we build collaborating with one another and with the feds is muscle memory that we keep because at our best, we do work together in a respectful way. And if the feds have the ability to act only on their own and they ignore states, I believe we are worse for that. So yes, there's an opportunity there. Yes, we need to seize it. And I hope we can fix this failing in Congress, giving the FTC that authority. And with that authority, I would love to see them continue to operate in a collaborative spirit. And then in, in the same regard, can, can you speak a little about any opportunities you see between the state AG community and private antitrust plaintiff practitioners like the folks in this organization um, that, that could more collaboratively uh, address particular issues in the antitrust field? Yeah, let me talk about that. That's a great topic. In the case I mentioned, the case against Google related to in-app purchases, the state AGs are proceeding on a parallel track to private um, antitrust counsel representing consumers. And at our best, we find ways to be collaborative and supportive given a shared goal of helping consumers. And there've been a number of instances where we get to see that and try that out. If we, can find those pathways, I think it will be a win-win. And so I've looked for that both in the antitrust area and other areas. And it's, it's a conversation worth having both in a case-by-case -case specifically, but also when we get the opportunity on a more meta fashion about how we find ways to both advocate for consumers and to make sure that our work is complementary. We had a case in Colorado, by the way, involving CenturyLink where there was a private class action that proceeded in tandem with our work and both had the benefit of helping consumers. And I'm always cognizant where we can, how do we make sure consumers are protected and the actions that are happening both in private cases and public cases are benefiting them. Thanks. Uh, you know, in the um, Apple v. Pepper case from a few years back, your predecessor signed on to the uh, brief of the amicus brief of the state attorneys general, and uh, which was calling for the reversal of uh, Illinois BRIC. Um, I'm curious if you would have done so if you were attorney general at the time, 
and why or why not? Um, well, uh, Illinois Brick was written by Justice White. So I, I have to um, have some uh, humility in criticizing it, but nonetheless, uh, I will say, I worry that its underlying reasoning, again, influenced by the Chicago School, may have led to a practical result of disabling recovery. And that is a concern I have. Um, Dan, you know the answer. How many states have passed Illinois repealer laws? A lot. Um, yeah, about uh, in the low 20s somewhere. I thought it was more than that. Um, in any event, obviously, if the, uh, if the work is being done, um, like the question that we got earlier about Colorado's uh, surcharging law, we can now take a look at what has happened in different states, kind of like happened with um, resale price maintenance. If you have natural experiments, I'm really keen to see that work. Um, as a first order approximation, I would be inclined to uh, join with my predecessor in thinking that Illinois brick is often a greater bar to a recovery than it is in theory accomplishing its goals. Um, I did not review that amicus brief, so I can't say specifically if I agree with it, but the broad sentiment concern is one I, I share. And what I would really love to see, and if you all here can follow up with me, if there's been literature looking at those states with repealer laws and those without, without them, what do we learn from it? Um, that can be extremely powerful data. Well, to, to follow up on that, what, uh, how do you feel about a repealer law in Colorado? You know, it hasn't come up yet, and I, um, I would like to see what um, those other laws in other states looks like to figure out what a model law would look like for Colorado. If people have ideas for me on that, um, please share them. Um, we have passed some laws in Colorado relating to our antitrust and consumer protection laws, raising um, civil penalties, for example. We also passed a law that uh, we had a screwy law here that said if the feds approved a merger, we were, were, were not able to challenge it under state law. We fixed that. So we're going to keep looking at those issues. This is a meaningful pause to let Paul ask us another question. <laughs> One thing I wanted to, to ask you about is the area of the intersection between labor law and antitrust. We've seen an expansion in the number of no poaching cases, for example. Um, are there other areas that you see as potentially emerging that involve the intersection of those two fields? It's a really important question and I appreciate. Um, so uh, really appreciate you raising it. The, the concern is there are rules, no poach is one example, non-competes is a second, that are being imposed by businesses to depress prices that or salaries that workers can get because they can. And there's no legitimate business reason or efficiency behind it. Um, the skeptical eye being cast at those arrangements is warranted. And there's room for more work on that. There's been some discussion at the federal level, even in asking, could you have a rulemaking at the FTC limiting the use of non-competes where there's no justification for it? So I am broadly sympathetic to this effort. I was at the DOJ when the process started with the no poach investigations. And my colleague, Bob Ferguson has done a lot of this in Washington. Just put this into context. There were some of these no poach rules for like, people within the same franchises. So if you owned like a Hardee's franchise, you, could, you couldn't hire someone from a, I don't know what the exact ones were, but another franchise. Those workers didn't have any trade secrets. It wasn't about protecting any investment. It was purely about depressing wages for those who were among the lower paid workers. So just plainly wrong.
So, you know, is there, if you had a, a, a wish list that you could uh, uh, throw out either on the federal or the state level of uh, ways in which uh, the antitrust laws could be either expanded or broadened in their in, in their application. Uh, is there anything else that you haven't mentioned already that's there, on there that is. wish list? Yeah, there is, Dan. Um, it's crazy that we're not funding the antitrust authorities to do their work at more robust levels. I believe I heard somewhere that even though we've seen more concentration happening, more concern, the budget, the antitrust division is 30% less than it was when I was there a decade ago. That's insane. So we need to invest in antitrust enforcement. It pays, uh, it pays uh, huge dividends. Um, and so we really need to uh, be vigilant. And then Josh put in there that he posted a link. Uh, I am not seeing it in the chat myself about uh, an argument on the direct purchaser rule. And I think the article says that repealing it would be a mistake. Yeah, I don't see it either, Josh. But we'll make sure you get it because thank you. It's an important issue to this uh, to a and lot of people. What's your view? What's your view on repealing an Illinois brick? Oh boy! Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, and I may be a uh, minority of one on this. Um, I actually uh, think that there are huge problems with uh, uh, with Illinois brick. So I agree with you on on that. Um, I think the 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 article that uh, Josh was referring to and that others talk about are the dangers of repealing Illinois BRIC sort of in a vacuum, and what what the consequences might be uh, uh, of that. Um, and I'll let uh, others who uh, uh, who have stronger feelings about it uh, speak uh, if they'd like uh, on that point. But I do think it's it is an area that um, bears discussion uh, between the private bar and, and the state AGs and, and the federal enforcers as well. Um, so that um, uh, I do think it should be a discussion going forward. I think a lot of us were a little surprised um, at the tenor of the, uh, of the amicus and, uh, and uh, the view of, of uh, some of the states. Uh, particularly those that already have repealers um, in place joining in it. So um, it's an interesting issue. It's a tough issue. Um, I think the biggest concerns are that by repealing it, you're going to, uh, particularly given some of the uh, current uh, uh, views out there uh, that uh, and the current state of affairs, that you would end up harming uh, consumers more by the repealer or the reversal of the repealer than uh, than otherwise. So uh, Deborah in the chat mentioned it's 36, which is more consistent with what I thought it was. Oh, yes. uh, and Josh sent, I got your article, Josh. His point is you summarized it well just by reading the title. Um, I will read the article as I think about the question you asked do we want to do. And I can't tell if Josh's article applies only to uh, a doctrinal repeal, or does it include repealer statutes at the state level? Are they also the subject of his criticism? But I will look at that and evaluate it and interested to hear from people more on this topic. Well, I see Josh has his hand up, so we're gonna let him speak to this. I think I was, I was, uh brought in so I, I could remark, but I don't want to hog the mic. So if there's other No, it's, it's perfect timing, Josh. Josh, so uh, does your yeah. argument apply to both uh, state statutes and a Supreme Court action, or is it only the Supreme Court action? O only Supreme Court or legislative action. And what I would say is I'm all for repealer statutes on a state-by-state -state basis, where you're just increasing uh, the rights of indirect purchasers mostly. Um, the concern would be no, I would say that to boil it down in, in a soundbite, 
repealing Illinois brick by itself and allowing indirect purchasers to sue, I don't think is uh, concerning for private enforcement. Re repealing Hanover shoe and allowing a pass on defense would have all sorts of complicated effects, in including potentially making it very difficult to certify a class, even for direct purchasers. And so that's, the, that's sort of the key procedural issue that's hidden. And the question is, to rep is repealing one tantamount to repealing the other, which would very likely happen if the Supreme Court were to act. And that's the, that's the kernel of the concern. All right, so before I sign the amicus brief, Dan, I gotta withdraw my prior statement. I need to spend some more time with you and Josh. And <laughs> I'm a big fan of these sorts of dialogues. And I will say having antitrust enforcers at the state level engaged on amicus briefs can be a valuable tool. We filed a brief recently at the court uh, this year with the NCAA case um, where the NCAA really didn't have a good justification for their position to withhold any form of payment. And that's why they lost unanimously at the Supreme Court. But I was able to hear from both and, and try to understand the different arguments and how to reconcile them. I don't know what process went into that other um, type of decision in the amicus brief you mentioned, Dan, but I, I would welcome and encourage all of you to talk to others. Uh, please, when these issues come up, these conversations are important. Let me make a reverse plug for COSEL as an amicus uh, support um, for any state antitrust enforcement issues that are out there as well. That um, don't don't overlook the opportunity to to enlist our organization to uh, come in because we are strong believers in state antitrust enforcement. I think I mentioned the Facebook case that we lost on latches grounds. So if you're looking for such an opportunity, there, there, um, there's one. So, uh, so I, I, I uh, asked to come back a little bit early just because I was so, I'm so pleased by how this, uh, the evening is ending up because this has been a terrific dialogue and um, we ended up hitting on uh, the Illinois brick, you know, repealer issue and question has been a big one for our organization. And as um, we were articulating, this is a hard one because it's not, um, uh, it's not an obvious position for a group that represents consumers in class action, antitrust class actions, very often to take the position that we don't want to see uh, Illinois BRIC be, be repealed. But because of the jurisprudence that has built up over so many decades now, since we've had these rules in place, um, just you know, repealing Illinois brick, which would probably bring you with it hand over shoe, we can see a, a, we would end up being worse for enforcement, we think, than better. But we're really pleased to have had that to have that conversation. And Paul is exactly right. Uh, very pleased to just make this connection with you because I think we are like minded and fellow travelers in so many in, in so many ways, in so many areas. And um, we as an organization don't do enough to reach out to the state AGs and the state enforcers. So we hope we can continue talking at some point. Well, view me as a good liaison to help do that. I think that relationship plus one you got with Josh already baked in the legal academy, that's an important one as well. Absolutely. So uh, we are now at the, at the one hour mark. This was so uh, terrific and so, uh, so substantive and we had you all over the map. <laughs> you, you were I, lo I love Pam how we touched on all these topics from political polarization and January 6 to uh, Illinois brick and everything in between. So anyway, so thank you so, so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a stilted format. So you, you can't hear applause, but, but, but everybody's applauding. Um, so thanks. We'll let you go on with your, your evening. And thank you everybody for, for tuning in. Um, and there will be more COSAL events as the year goes on. Thank you all so much now. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.